This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Division of Arts and Humanities at the University of California, San Diego, presents Degrees of Health and Well-Being, a series of public lectures featuring leading faculty from multiple disciplines in history, science, medicine, and social science, each sharing their latest groundbreaking research, impacting the quality of life for you, your family, your region, and your world. It's a huge pleasure to introduce a true international superstar tonight, Stephanie Strafty. She is the Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences. She is the Harold Simon Professor and Chief of the Division of Global Public Health in UC San Diego's School of Medicine. And she's the director of our Global Health Institute. She received her PhD in epidemiology from the University of Toronto. She went on from there to the University of British Columbia for a spell, Johns Hopkins for a little bit, and then we poached her from Hopkins in 2004. She's been here ever since. She works on infectious diseases, and I believe she'll be talking to us a bit about that this evening and has spent the last 20 years or so focusing on the issue of HIV prevention in underserved and marginalized populations in developing countries. What I especially like and admire about Professor Strathdee is these two closely related features. Her work, which is a passion for her, stems so directly from personal experience and it leads her to give back from her work into personal experience in the real world. She describes in an interview how, as an undergraduate, she lost one of her instructors, later her PhD supervisor, and her best friend to HIV ad, AIDS, and that was a stimulus to devote her life to work connected with that problem. When she was studying for her master's, she went to work recruiting sex workers and drug users to a World Health Organization research program and discovered that many of these victims had experienced sexual abuse in childhood. That had a personal connection for her as well and also impelled her in the direction of the work that she's done. But the work that she does gives back to the communities that she studies. And I love this statement that was quoted by her in an article on her in Lancet. She said, I always emphasize to students the importance of research having impact in the real world, away from the ivory tower. And she continues, as for myself, I just want to continue this amazing life where I actually get paid for doing work that I am passionate about. If I can one day make myself redundant because we have made a serious dent in halting HIV AIDS, I'll be a very happy woman. So on Postcard from the Trenches, Tijuana's Hidden Epidemics of HIV and Tuberculosis, please welcome to the podium Professor Stephanie Strafty. Thanks very much to Steve and to Alan and to the Division of Arts and Humanities and all of the sponsors and to all of you for coming tonight. I'm going to talk to you about our research and our training program 20 minutes away from here, which is in Tijuana, Mexico. And I'm going to tell you not just about the research, but what we're trying to do to make a difference. So some of you have been to Tijuana. How many people in the audience? Put up your hands. Oh, everybody. Okay, well, this is my Tijuana. This is the Tijuana River Canal. Now, we're in a drought most of the time. 
So this is usually, you know, running with water in a regular, um, you know, rainy season, but it's mostly sewage when it runs down this canal. And when it's dry like this, there are these open areas here that are basically sewer portals that will run into the city. And those represent hiding places for the people who live there. Uh, many of the photos that you'll see tonight are from a book called uh, Tomorrow is a Long Time by John Cohen with photographs from Malcolm Linton. Um, and I want to thank them for lending them to me this evening. And any of the pictures and the names that I use are with permission. Um, this photo is of the Tijuana River Canal while the sewage is running. And the smell, I have to tell you, is pretty overwhelming at times. And all of these little dots are people, people who are living in the trenches. They're living in the most inhumane conditions that you can imagine. And when I first started working in Tijuana, I knew that there were people living down there, but it was a no-go zone. It was, it was dangerous. And when we asked people where they lived, they said El Bordo. I said, where is El Bordo? They said, oh, you know, in the Tijuana River Canal. And so, of course, I wanted to go down there right away and see exactly how people were living. But because it was considered dangerous, how are we going to gain the trust of people? So somebody had the brilliant idea to um, give the participants in our new study, which was called Proyecto El Cuete, and Cuete is slang for syringe, um, to give them uh, disposable cameras so that they could chronicle their lives. And when we gave them these cameras and they brought them back to us and we had all of these photos of, of this, uh, I was really stunned. And um, that was when they said, well, come, we'll show you. And we began what is now um, in our 15th year of, um, of our, our work in this region. And on the other side of um, this wall, um, which really separates Mexico and the US, is another wall um, along the Via Rapida, which if you're driving to Rosarito, you'll, you'll pass this wall on your right hand side and you'll see people sitting on the wall and maybe hunching over each other like this and you'll wonder what the heck they're doing. Well, actually, they are injecting drugs. Um, and um, why this guy is leaning over helping this guy inject is because um, the fellow who is being injected has corroded his veins. They have collapsed. Um, he's been injecting black tar heroin for years, likely. And as a result of that, he, he has no veins left where he can inject himself. So he pays this other guy, who's a doctor of another kind, a hit doctor. He pays him often with, um, with drugs um, measured in the syringe to inject him. And as a result, this syringe is often shared. So these are the conditions, the risk environment that, that I'm going to be telling you about. One of our uh, colleagues here at UCSD, um, Kimberly Brower, uh, studied the spatial distribution of where people are injecting and how it relates to HIV infection. So this is the border from this um, spatial map and the two highways, 5 and 805, that we all know so well. And in um, red are the, the most dense spots, most densely uh, populated um, locations where people are injecting drugs. And you'll see that the biggest red splotch is right on the border. And that's in this region that I was just showing you about. And so this means, and, and you can see that it spills over onto the US side. So what we're, we're talking about here is not just Mexico's problem, not just the US's problem. This is a shared population. So we know that there's 47 million border crossings northbound that are legal every year or so. Lots more of un illegal crossings too. But this population um, spills over in a lot of different ways um, through infectious disease, and I'll talk to you about that. So just to get a little sense of, of um, HIV in, in, in the context of the Americas, um, Haiti is, is um, the country with the highest HIV prevalence, and on the bottom is Bolivia. And at a country level, Mexico is very close to the bottom. So you'd think, you know, not a big problem. This is, you know, there's much more serious things to worry about. But our studies have actually shown that Tijuana's HIV prevalence rate is much higher than Mexico and much higher than the United States, which is around here. So about one in 112 persons between the ages of 15 and 44 in Tijuana is likely to be HIV positive. 
And we shared this data with our Mexican counterparts and we collectively um, released a press release in both Spanish and English to draw attention to this problem. We did it in a very strategic way so that we could um, help um, garner more HIV prevention resources for the city and I'll be telling you about that as well. One of my other colleagues here at UCSD is uh, Sanjay Mehta. He's actually taken every single HIV positive sample that we've collected from our studies over the last decade or so and subtyped it. So to be able to look at the genetic fingerprint and this is a, a network of, of um, different nodes and how these infections are related to one another. And he found that there were five um, different binational clusters. These are clusters where there's infections that on the US side and the Mexican side that are linked. They share the same virus. So um, there, he also found that a higher proportion of these individuals who were in the binational clusters were sex workers. And so often there's sex workers in Tijuana, there are um, clients, uh, male clients from the US who go down there. And um, you can see very easily how we might have a, an HIV epidemic because HIV knows no borders and has no passport. And over time, we have also, um, through our work with Dr. Mehta, looked at the migration of the viruses between San Diego and Tijuana. So in the beginning, in blue here, you see that, um, that the direction was more from San Diego to Tijuana. And, you know, because we had a, had a much higher HIV prevalence in this country and a lot of migrants were coming north to work and then going back home and infecting people in their rural communities. But in more recent years, we've seen it blow back. So now we're starting to see more cases come from Tijuana to San Diego. So again, a shared population, a shared problem, and as you'll hear me advocate for, a shared responsibility. So apart from HIV, we've also got situations um, with other infections, and today I'll just talk to you about one, which is tuberculosis, or TB. And HIV and TB really run together in an unhealthy way. Um, of the 42 million people in the, who have HIV in, in the world, about one-third also have TB. And if you have TB um, infection and you have HIV, you're much more likely to develop active tuberculosis over time. So 10% more likely each year that you have um, TB. And so um, it's, it's very concerning because if, if you don't take your medicines um, for, for tuberculosis very religiously, um, you will develop uh, multi-drug resistant or extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. And um, when we look at the Mexico and, and U.S. Um, rates of tuberculosis, we see that both California and Baja California to, our, our, to the south have the highest rates of TB in their respective countries. And the borders um, on both sides um, have higher rates than, than the country, their own countries overall. And so clearly, um, you know, we are concerned about TB in, in the border region because a lot of the imported cases that we see in the United States are from Mexico. And in our studies of injection drug users and female sex workers and um, people who are homeless living in the River Canal that I've shown you, the prevalence of latent TB infection, so this is silent infection that may not be symptomatic and could become active infection, this prevalence of latent TB infection is extremely high in all of these populations, injection drug users, non-injection drug users who are using heavy drugs, and female sex workers and the homeless have over 50% of these populations have latent TB. I was so stunned by these data when we first um, did this research that I thought there was a mistake with the test and it was retested and retested and we keep getting the same results. Um, and in Mexico, if you have TB, um, and unless you're less than five or you have HIV infection, they will not treat latent TB infection. They, they, they feel they don't have enough resources. We also followed a bunch of injection drug users in my study over time to determine the incidence of latent TB infection and found that we had a 52% incidence rate. So that was the rate of new infections within that year. And so this is a, a very serious problem indeed. Now, in terms of active TB, where people have actually developed um, the um, active and very fulminating cases, 
We um, also have a little bit of data on this. Um, we asked our injection drug users in our study in Tijuana, have you been ever told by a doctor or nurse that you have had active TB? And um, about 10% of them said yes. And so here, um, this is um, a, a slide showing you what that diagnosis looked like and how they were treated. So here, um, active TB was diagnosed in the United States about 75% of the time. And then um, this um, bar is showing you the percentage of those people who were diagnosed in the US who'd received um, tuberculosis medicines, which was great, very high percentage. This bar, though, shows that it's stopped prematurely. So these folks have to be taking um, TB medicines for at least six months, sometimes up to a year, every single day. And um, the most um, common source or, or cause of TB treatment interruption was deportation. So here you have immigration policies and health policies colliding. It's exactly the wrong thing to do. If you know if your doctor gives you um, a prescription and says take all these medicines, it, they're telling you that because they don't want um, resistance to develop. And in this case, um, if you stop your medicines before the six months or a year, you know, you're going to develop multi-drug resistant TB. And so we're creating these conditions where we're worsening an infection that's already bad. And, you know, as I mentioned, um, these uh, medicines are hard to take. So for our populations, like Martha Patricia shown here, um, she um, has had a very difficult time with her tuberculosis infection because she's homeless and she's a sex worker and she has HIV. And so doctors generally um, get, give them medicines every single day through what's called directly observed therapy or DOT. And this is very laborious because it means that a patient has to travel to the doctor every single day and the provider has to watch them. So what's very interesting is one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Richard Garfine, together with Dr. Kevin Patrick here at UCSD, developed um, a very interesting video DOT platform, which is now being um, scaled up. So what you see is a smartphone, which almost everybody has. And um, the patient actually can take a selfie of themselves taking the medication. And then the little video clip is zoomed back to the provider, and then it can be safely stored. So this is actually being tested now in Tijuana with our homeless populations, and we'll be able to tell you how it works. But it's been shown to be cost effective and has the potential to be scaled globally. Now for people like Martha Patricia, and here she is again working on the street, um, women who have um, these special needs require special interventions. And if you are a female sex worker and you inject drugs, you have the opportunity, or unfortunately, to become infected with HIV through two different routes, through sharing um, syringes or through unprotected sex. And this means that um, we have to be really creative in ways to help these women stay safe. So we developed, um, in one of the behavioral interventions that I um, um, started uh, a few years ago, um, a study um, with um, a video intervention, and I'll tell you about it. So the project is called Mujer Masagura, or More Healthy Women. And it had a little video, um, five minutes long, that was developed in the United States with a previous study. And it had a woman sitting behind a desk with a lab coat on saying, this is how you can con contaminate your injection equipment by mistake. Um, and, you know, it uses a a drop of fluorescent dye to mimic blood, and it shows how everything can co become contaminated. And I showed these women who are actual sex workers that inject drugs in Tijuana, I showed them this five minute video and I said, I was thinking of like dubbing this and putting it into our intervention. Do you think that, you know, it would make you want to change your behavior? And they looked at me and they said like, no. And I said, well, like why? And they said, well, first of all, she's not brown like us. Second of all, like, she doesn't look like a drug user or a sex worker, it, but could we make our own video? And I said, oh man, I don't have this in my budget. I don't know what the National Institute of Drug Abuse is going to say about this, but I found the money. And so we actually had um, you know, producers come down and shoot this video, and the women designed their own script around this scene. And I'm going to show you a few stills, and if you're interested in the video, I'll send you the clip. So it's called um, One Drop of Blood, or Una Gota de Sangre. 
And um, they um, are all in this shooting gallery, which is a place where people rent their syringes and inject in groups. And um, so obviously they're incubators for HIV infection. Um, so this is Mary Lou. And uh, Mary Lou, when I first met her, was in her early 50s. She had a daughter who um, died of tuberculosis and left behind her daughter, so Mary Lou's granddaughter, who was three years old. So Mary Lou was raising her, as well as her own subsequent daughter, who was five years old. So here she's got a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and she's addicted to both methamphetamine and heroin and tricks on the corner so that she can buy her pampers. And she's saying, don't you judge me. I'm doing the best I can with, with the resources I've been given. I've been deported from the United States. I, you know, I, I have um, HIV. You know, I, I don't have any other source of income. And you know, uh, she had a good point. But she was one of the stars in our video, and she says, Hi, I'm Mary Lou. I'm going to show you how can contamination can occur from one place to another when uh, we're preparing our drugs. She's actually got a syringe behind her ear there, by the way. Um, Hello, I'm Gina. HIV and Hep C worry all of us, Takatos and Takatas. So again, they're using their own language, their own slang. Takatas means a female version of injection drug user. Hello, I'm Lily. We're going to show you how blood and viruses that are in one piece of equipment can contaminate other pieces of equipment using a special dye. This dye glows in the dark when we use a black light. Hello, my name is Laura. Here we have two syringes. In one, I place a small quantity of dye to represent the blood that gets left inside a syringe after it's been used to shoot drugs. We'll soon see how the special dye goes from one place to another. Remember, the dye represents infected blood. Don't forget, a tiny amount of blood is enough to transmit HIV and Hep C. And at the end, she says, as you can see, with the assistance of the black light, everything is contaminated. The syringes, the plunger, the cotton, the cooker, the water, and even my fingers. And she lifts up her fingers and she shows. And every woman who sees this video is like, oh my god, I never share this syringe, but I always share the water. And so then this is the kind of way we have changed their behavior. And this um, intervention reduced needle sharing by 95% among this population and has been shown to be cost effective. But there are other barriers to HIV prevention in Tijuana beyond access to syringes and some of the issues I've talked to you about. And these include police harassment. So what do I mean by this? Well, um, you have situations like this um, of waterboarding, where this actually happened in the Tijuana River Canal. You have beatings. One of our staff um, took a photo of this. Um, we have sexual abuse that was highlighted in um, El Mexicano, which is one of the n local newspapers. And one of the most pervasive things is that the police actually take the syringes away from drug users on the street and they break them. And they say, you shouldn't be using syringes. You shouldn't be doing this. And of course, um, what happens is drug users just go into the shooting galleries and they rent the syringes and it, it just perpetuates HIV infection and hepatitis C as well. And of, of course, what happens too is that if a police officer is breaking the syringe, they can put themselves at risk through a needle stick incident. And so one of my colleagues, Leo Boletsky, um, he had the brilliant idea of trying to bundle occupational safety and HIV prevention into an educational program for the police. And we approached the, the Tijuana mayor, and we approached the, the Tijuana police chief, and we said, hey, you know, you guys seem to have a needle stick injury problem. Do you know how many needle sticks you have? And they said, we have no idea. We said, well, we'll develop a surveillance and response program for you, and we'll also develop um, an educational program for you if you'd like. And they thought it was a great idea. I told them it wouldn't cost them any money. I went and got money from the National Institute of Drug Abuse to help evaluate the program. It's the first of its kind. We now have this whole team, by national team, which includes PhD students, and postdoctoral fellows, and we're, we're now we've trained over 600 police officers, and they really are changing their behaviors, which is really exciting. So um, the last barrier to HIV prevention I wanted to talk to you about that exists in Tijuana is access to free, well-resourced, and non-judgmental health care and, and prevention services. So. Um, we actually um, had this mobile van that um, was called the Preve Mobile, um, with VIH is HIV in Spanish, and Preve means to test, and, and it's also got you know prevention in there. And so we asked um, you know our our colleagues in Tijuana, what do you need? 
And they said, well, we really want to have a mobile van so we can deliver services to the people because here in Tijuana, we still have the milkman. The milkman still comes to your house. And why should we tell people to go to a building for HIV prevention when everybody knows if you go in that building that you have HIV? So um, this van was used to recruit participants for my study during the day. And at night I said, you can do whatever you want with this van. And they said, you mean we could do needle exchange? And I said, yes, <laughs> just don't tell the National Institute of Health. <laughs> and actually, the, at the time, the National Institute of Health said, if it's at night, you know, and it's not your staff, then we have no problem. So this van turned into not just a syringe exchange, but an opportunity to provide condoms and provide HIV testing. And the Mexican government was so in love with the idea that they developed a whole cadre of these similar vehicles called the Condonetas. And they, I was stunned when they did this. They told me they were going to, and I, I yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But then this, this is the governor of Baja California at the time. He called me up and he said, Steffi, um, he's the only person I let call me Steffi other than my grandma. And he said, Steffi, could you come down to Tijuana tomorrow? We have like a little surprise for you. And he unveiled these condonetas, and they have these loudspeakers on the top and these TV screens in the back, and they go down the Zona Roja, which is the red light district, and they go, condones, no, condones, jeringas, so condoms, syringes, and it's kind of like the ice cream truck. And, and in a very conservative environment, to think that you could be doing this, it's got dancing condoms all painted all over it. Now these exist in every Mexican state, so we had something to do with this, and it was through a little creative resourcing of our own that we spawned this, this movement, so I'm very proud of that. Now, on a sadder note, um, Mexico has been really grappling with the resources to combat HIV infection, and this is a photo that was taken by Malcolm Linton at an AIDS hospice called Las Memorias, which is about an hour's drive outside of Tijuana, and it's, oh, it's way out of of the city because nobody wanted an AIDS hospice in their backyard. The stigma is still so pervasive. Now this fellow died a few years ago, um, but he, he died within a day of this photo being taken. He has a net over his face because he, he was so weak he could not wipe the flies off of his face. And people are still dying like this in Mexico. There used to be AIDS hospices in the US and in Canada. I worked at, at them myself. And they're empty now because with the advent of antiretroviral therapy um, and the provision of, of treatment, that people are, are staying alive a lot better and, and, and living longer lives. But in Mexico, getting the treatments to the people is still a major problem. So this is a slide from um, one of my um, postdoctoral fellows who's now an assistant professor. She took um, the 191 people that we had um, HIV infection data on and she looked at how the cascade of HIV care occurred. So she found that only 47% of them had ever been tested for HIV before they got their HIV diagnosis. Only 11% um, were aware of their HIV status as a result of this. And so if you're not aware of your HIV status, um, then you can't get into care because how would you, how would you even know? And only 11% had been linked to care, so they were actually being seen by a provider. And as a result, only 3.7% were receiving antiretroviral therapy. So this is one of the most abysmal cascades to care um, scenarios that I'm aware of. It's worse than Africa because Africa receives a lot of support. And it's 20 minutes away from where we're sitting right now. So this is very sad. So what we have done at UCSD is try to, with the limited resources we have, to create opportunities for people to provide services. So with an NIH grant, we can't provide services. We're doing research. But within the context of, of doing outreach in the canal or in, in um, a clinic which is called Health Frontiers in Tijuana, we are providing training to our students and we are allowing our students to provide free care to the poor. So Health Frontiers in Tijuana is a binational, student-run free clinic. And the students actually, for credit, are providing care and they're, and they're precepted by medical faculty from both universities. And um, I'll just show you this clip now. Te digo, tener fuerza, voluntad, no a las drogas y el medicamento. Yo sé que si lo, lo utilizo así, puede durar mucho tiempo. Les doy las gracias una vez más a los doctores, 
y personas de Preven Casa que me han ayudado hasta aquí con mi tratamiento. It makes my heart warm to see that students and um, faculty from both sides of the border can work together to um, provide what is needed. Um, but we also have gone beyond the medical side. I mean, this is a university that it doesn't see health as just a medical issue. It's the whole person, it's the whole body. And we have developed um, a global health major that was actually developed um, within Eleanor Roosevelt College at first, first as a global health minor, now as a global health major. And it's the first in the UC system and there is a undergraduate field component where some students go internationally and some want to work closer to home and they have been actually um, spending their time in Tijuana at the clinic and so we have lots of different research projects for them that span not just the health sciences but the social sciences as well. We have also developed a, a diplomato or certificate program for Mexican students and so um, we have provided um, educational um, offerings to Mexican students um, at many levels, especially um, undergraduates and master's levels. And when I was looking at these slides not too long ago, I recognized a face in the bottom right hand because this, these slides, um, these photographs were from 2007. And that woman, Susie, is now a staff, um, one of my most prized uh, promotoras or outreach workers who goes into the canal and recruits people um, and follows them up for my research study. So I inadvertently trained one of my, my most precious jewels. Um, the other um, aspect to this is that through the collective work that we've done to show that HIV was, was rising in, in Tijuana and in uh, other populations that have links to uh, Latin America, that Mexico was eligible for funds from the uh, Global Fund to fight HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, and they received $76 million for HIV prevention. Now that funding dried up and um, we're back to square one, but it shows the power of data when people work together to make a, a change. But what else is needed? UCSD can't do it all um, by itself. And my view is that since many of the risk factors that we've talked about today are rooted in social, economic, and political realities, that interventions need to be focused upstream. So we've got to stop blaming people for their bad behaviors when it's really the social, political, and economic kind of conditions that we have sometimes created ourselves that are driving this. So one of my hopes is that we could revisit the Merida Initiative. Now, some of you might remember uh, two former presidents of the U.S. and Mexico met in Merida uh, to come up with a way to deal with the drug war. And they came up with four different pillars. One is to disrupt the capacity of organized crime to operate. Two is to institutionalize capacity to sustain the rule of law. Three is to create a 21st century border structure. And four is to build strong and resilient communities. Now, most of the money for this has been spent on interdiction and you know border enforcement and drones and all of those things. But under this um, president's administration, there has been an intent to work on, to build stronger, more resilient communities. And as you've seen through this presentation, if we don't do that, we have a blowback to our own country. So it's in our best interest to do this. So I believe that we should be build, building bridges and not walls, ladies and gentlemen. And I hope that I'll be standing here in the future to be able to say that we have a binational partnership to address health conditions that affect all people in the border because they're linked to so many of us beyond. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the co-investigators and, and the National Institute of Drug Abuse and other um, NIH institutes who have supported us as well as um, the foundation for the Harold Simon Chair. And I also want to um, especially thank my husband, Tom Patterson, who uh, started a lot of the research studies in Tijuana, which um, have really flourished. And he is an inspiration to me. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, what is the
the Tijuana's government's position on needle exchange? Do they support it? The question is, what is Tijuana's uh, and, and the Mexican government's view on needle exchange programs? Do they support it? That view has changed since I started working here um, at UCSD um, in 2004. At first, they were very hesitant um, and very concerned that um, the needle exchange was going to you know, send a wrong message to kids or was going to promote drug use. And all of those concerns were concerns that had been put forward by the Office of National Drug Control Policy in the United States. So it was almost like Mexico was mirroring some of the, the federal concerns in, in the US that had been put forth. But that changed. Um, the Mexican federal government um, endorsed um, harm reduction, which is the whole philosophy that includes needle exchange programs in about 2003, um, 2004, but it wasn't until we started to show that HIV was on the rise in Tijuana that they enacted that. And so the, the Condonetas were part of that whole movement to expand syringe exchange. So I think there's now 11 Mexican states that support it. And um, the municipal and state governments have changed um, at many times since I've begun working here. And um, they do support needle exchange. They, there is a needle exchange program. There's two actually in Tijuana. But after the global fund money uh, ended, um, the number of syringes just like fell off dramatically. And as a result, um, many people are sharing syringes again. And we've started to see HIV infection spiking. So unfortunately, just because you believe in something doesn't mean that you're going to actually do something about it. And sustaining the sterile syringe access is really important. But I think for those of you who aren't familiar with needle exchange programs, it's one aspect of a continuum. You really need to be providing people with drug treatment. And so there's very few methadone maintenance programs, for example, in Tijuana. And those that exist are, um, are private. And so people who are very poor have to you know, do whatever they can to, you know, purchase their methadone. And to, in my view, it should be offered free. Are the police continuing to take needles and destroy them like you said? It's gotten much better um, because we pointed out that they're putting themselves and their families at risk. So they often um, now don't confiscate syringes. We also pointed out that the Mexican law allows people to carry syringes without a prescription, which is something that they did not know. And so through the, the bundling of occupational safety messages with HIV prevention messages, we have seen a change, and I'll be reporting on that in the year ahead. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I was very impressed with the whole presentation, but especially the, the final message about be, building strong and vibrant communities. And then I couldn't help thinking about what's happening right here in the United States. And then some of those scenes uh, of the, uh, the border and the, the, uh, the sewage tunnels remind me of places I've seen here. And right now with, the, um, with, what's, with what's happening in New Hampshire, you know, part of our democracy, we're hearing of a very high rate of deaths due to heroin mm -hmm. overdoses. That's right. So, um, so I'm just thinking how global this really is, and I don't know whether you have any more information than anyone else right now about the Zika virus, and why is that opportunistic, the way tuberculosis is? I mean, why now, all of a sudden, is a virus that's been around for a long time suddenly having this effect on uh, pregnant women? Are they also people who are we don't know if drugs are related, but we know that poverty is. Well, I think that viruses, even though they don't have brains, they, they seem to um, be very opportunistic in capitalizing upon the very weaknesses of our society. So in terms of HIV, sex and death and homosexuality and all of these kinds of things are a nexus. And this virus has exploited it. And um, we haven't done a very good job as a society in dealing with these um, these issues, and we've been punished for it. Um, but with Zika virus, um, there's still a lot to be determined. That association between the Zika virus and uh, microencephaly and uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome is, is putative. It's, it's looking like it, it exists. But there has been speculation out there, and again, this isn't proven, that, that um, 
El Nino and some of the um, global warming effects um, are influencing mosquito behavior. And so we, as a result of mosquito behavior, are exposed to different viruses. So, you know, dengue and malaria have changed their distribution as a result of the changing weather patterns. So it, again, it's, it's important to be thinking about these macro level factors that influence HIV and Zika virus and other other infectious disease spread because they're all linked. Our, our behaviors as human beings um, affecting the, the different social and political and um, geographic and, um, and environmental conditions are, are, are at play. And um, I think that too often we're focused on, on the micro factors and don't really think of the long-term long impact. Thank you. Simple, dumb question. What do you mean, what did that mean here by tomorrow is a long time? It's not proper English, but it's... Well, uh, tomorrow is a long time is, is a phrase from a Bob Dylan song. And, and um, you know, I actually like the, the needle and the damage done uh, moniker myself. But this, uh, this book, Tomorrow is a Long Time, is, is a chronicle of HIV um, and the um, unchecked aspect of it in Tijuana and follows people um, that like Susie and like Martha Patricia and tells you the stories and that um, if you say tomorrow, 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 but tomorrow is a long time. So if you tell someone who's injecting drugs, well, you know, you could get HIV, you know, 10 years down the road if you share this syringe today. And like, you know, that tomorrow is a long time. Right now, I'm concerned with my next fix because that's the parasite that's on my back. And what people don't realize about heroin addiction in particular is that they, people get physically ill if they're not using. They're always chasing that, that first high that they got and it never ever, they can never get it back. Um, you get flu-like symptoms and you get um, you know, diarrhea and you get the shakes, all of these, these physical symptoms. So when you hear people in Tijuana talk about this, you hear them say, I have la malia. That means uh, the, the, it's dope sickness. And in every country that I've worked in where I've studied addiction like this, they have their own slang for this. And so in, in the US, people say, I'm, go I'm going to get well. That means I'm going to get my hit of heroin so that I can get rid of these terrible symptoms. So it's not like you're going to get high all the time. You're going to, to get well. So it's this terrible um, you know, circle, um, a vicious cycle. And so tomorrow is a long time really means that I'm taking care of today and tomorrow may never come. And um, it's sad that people are, are caught in, in that spiral. But you're, you're exactly right. The previous um, person asked about the, the heroin epidemic in the United States. And this is, has been linked to the prescription drug use epidemic as well. And there's um, pretty strong evidence that the pharmaceutical industry played a role in this too because they were getting kickbacks for people um, that were getting these prescriptions. And there were pill mills that were existing um, in many of them um, in rural states as well. So um, Southeast Indiana in a, in a very rural um, county that used to only see about five cases of HIV in a year, saw over 180 cases within a, half the, the period. And all of these kind of conditions for an HIV epidemic were that the state had no needle exchange program. It was actually illegal if you carried a syringe. You were subject to a federal um, you know, um, prison term. And um, there were only five HIV testing centers in the county. And they, several of them were shut down because they were Planned Parenthood clinics. And you have very, uh, very high levels of unemployment. So all of these, that's their risk environment. You can kind of see that there's similarities between Scott County and Tijuana. But again, these are, are remediable. Um, we, we know how to prevent these um, diseases. But we have to work to, to create the infrastructure for our communities to make it more resilient. And by making people, um, you know, have, having delayed Medicare, uh, Medicaid rollout or, you know, preventing Planned Parenthood from offering HIV testing because you don't agree with some of their other policies. Those kinds of decisions have downstream impacts. And so um, it's a, a long answer to your question, but I think, um, I think there are some important similarities that we see here in our own communities. I too would like to compliment you on the work you're doing. Uh, but as I sit here, and I'm not, I, I don't deal in this area, 
But as I sit here, I'm trying to think of what the common denominator is. And the only thing I can think of right now is self-gratification. Why do these people in Mexico do what they do, go into drugs and whatnot? Part of it's need, but some of it also applies to other people who have no need and it's self-gratification. The same with a lot of the ailments that face us here in the United States. I mean, you didn't mention obesity. Mm -hmm. It's self-gratification. So you take a look at this, and, and also, perhaps a lot of the crime, you know, or driving 95 miles an hour on the freeway, you know, is to gratify certain personal needs. And I'm just wondering, you know, what's done in terms of trying to change that? In other words, get to the core of the problem, rather than uh, not just, uh, rather than uh, combat it face on, which is fine, we have to do that. Mm -hmm. But what are we doing to get to the core? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's an important question because addiction, for example, um, is multifactorial. There's known to be genetic influences and environmental influences. Um, and certainly there are some people who, you know, go to use drugs the first time because they, they want to, they're curious about the high. But by and large from, I probably studied over 3,000 injection drug users uh, in my career to date. Most of them um, are using drugs because they are trying to to deal with with pain. Um, sometimes it's physical pain, but more often it's it's psychological pain. It's trauma. So, for example, childhood sexual abuse has been very closely linked with um, both substance use and um, sex trade. And um, I think that we need to have a, a much broader view. And um, we need to create um, programs for our children and our adolescents that are going to um, not just be this uh, just say no to drugs, uh, but really kind of give um, other alternatives um, for people's time and are going to give them self-gratification from another perspective. Um, and I, I think that in, in a country like Mexico, um, and especially in the border region, I mean, this is actually, if it was the 51st state, it would be the poorest in terms of every indicator. So when you have unemployment and you have a lot of despair and um, no real skills, um, you know, dealing with the hopelessness in your life, um, you know, it, it, and someone hands you, something that's going to make you feel better, you might try it. And so um, I'm not sure that I have a, a simple answer. I think it's very complex. Um, we've been grappling with this uh, problem for quite some time. But we have watched this, this opiate addiction in our own country unfold over the last um, several years, and we weren't doing anything about it until it, it started to affect um, young white people. Um, it, unfortunately, um, and when it, the HIV epidemic has been entrenched in black and Hispanic communities in urban cores for years and years, and it wasn't until just recently that it started to affect a different demographic that, um, that some of the um, legislatures um, decided that they would partially overturn the needle exchange ban. Now, I'm very happy that happened, but it was really a tragedy that we had to wait so long in 2015 to see an, a, a new outbreak occur at the scale that it has with massive um, um, overdose deaths as well. So we, we have lots to do, and um, I think that um, it's going to take more than just the health sector to deal with it. I, I was wondering about the 20 minutes I mean, to get to Tijuana. <laughs> yeah. Do, are, are your transportation facilitated? Are you asking how fast I drive? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking what cooperation you get from the U.S. and Mexican government to go back and forth. Oh, well, well thank God for the Sentry Pass. Um, um, my team generally parks on the U.S. side and walks across, but with a Sentry card, it is a fast pass. But it's, it's, it's still... Um, quite a queue uh, if you're driving. The Century Lane can still be, uh, going there is quick. Coming back is another story. It can be a couple of hours. What's your opinion on the, I would say, growing front of STD um, spread, which is uh, dating apps, which are available on a phone, very location-based, 
And very recently, some studies are showing that rates of infection for STDs and HIV go up by users. What, what are your thoughts on that, and perhaps how that interacts with the San Diego population interacting with the Tijuana population? Well, one of the infections that I didn't talk about today because of time is syphilis, um, which is a notifiable disease, which means that when you know, anybody tests positive for syphilis in San Diego, the health department has to um, you know, make a notification to the Centers for Disease Control, um, alarm bells kind of go off, and there's something called partner notification, which means that, um, that the person who tests positive for syphilis is asked to indicate who all of their sexual partners are so that they can be notified and tested and treated. Um, in Tijuana, we have syphilis rates that are through the roof, and they're actually very closely tied to HIV infection because syphilis is an ulcerative infection, and it can promote um, HIV acquisition. And there's no partner notification or partner tracing. There's no resources to do that. So these two epidemics, again, are linked, the syphilis cases um, in Tijuana versus the syphilis cases in um, San Diego where we've seen a, a, a very um, steep increase um, in STD rates is among young men having sex with men, especially um, those of color, um, a black and Hispanic men. And so th with um, rising rates of STDs, we've also seen rising rates of HIV as well. Um, and I, I think what you were getting at when you were talking about um, users of um, like the, the hookups that are happening through social media and um, you know, uh, smartphone apps and different um, websites like Grindr and things like that. Um, those definitely have played a role in terms of um, a disrupting social networks so that people aren't meeting necessarily at a bar, they're meeting online and then they're hooking up somewhere. So there's been a different spread of infectious disease patterns as a result of, of social media and, um, and, and the internet. And that's something that um, is being very carefully studied here at UCSD. Um, people like James Fowler and Susan Little are actually studying Twitter data and they're using Twitter and different hashtags and um, keywords to determine where sexual activity and high-risk sexual activity is taking place so that they could actually target resources to those communities. So I think that, that if we, we know where and, and through which means people are, are conducting risk, we can use that to target interventions and that's, that's where we're headed next. Thank you very much.